Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful that you are a God of love and compassion. And you have blessed our young men here to graduate from the academy. I pray, dear Father, that you would put your Holy Spirit into their lives and continue to lead them so that they will continue to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Be with them wherever they go. And I pray for all of those who are missing loved ones like my wife. And I just want to pray that you would give us comfort and that you would give us help. I now ask, dear Father, that you would be a part of the sermon this morning and that you would guide and direct my words. And I ask this all in Jesus' precious name. I don't think that we have a great trouble with uh, tongues in our church, although I know that we have many different languages here. Um, we could say Namaste, we could say Guten Tag, we could say Sabbat Berchit. We could say, uh, well, I could keep going. I don't think that the problem is with the languages or tongues or things like this. But it's, a, it's an age-old problem that we have. It's like last week when we were talking about love. In uh, 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, when we were talking about, about gifts, if you don't know what that picture is, it's a picture of a tongue. We still have problems with our tongues, don't we? You know, all of us have them. All of, them, all of us have words that come out and we say the wrong things. We want to be a church of love where we love one another. But we have this difficult... You know, when, when Paul was talking about the issues of tongues, you do realize that that's almost two millennia ago. And we're still facing the same problems. We're living in the postmodern age. We're supposed to be more advanced. We're supposed to, and yet what are we still facing with in the church? We're still facing the problem of selfishness. Has selfishness gone away? Um, I, I got into my checking account and find, found out that my account has been granted for something I know nothing about. Have any of you ever had that happen to you? Someone stealing things along the way. Have you ever been in the type of thing where, you know, we still live with these type of problems and we still have problems and not in this church, but in other churches, we have problems with people who think that they are special because the Holy Spirit comes upon them because they can speak in a different language. I've been trained. I, I know that I can speak in a different language most of you can't speak in. I, I, can, I can quote you in our case. Kai Hologos, Kai... I can do that, and you know, you're all going, okay, what is that? And arche means in beginning. Logos should have tipped you off. In the beginning was what? The word. Now you know what I'm saying to you. But if I was up here and, and preaching the whole sermon, and, and Greek here, you all would have some type of trouble. In fact, the language that I would speak to you is an arcane language. They don't even speak it in Greek. Greeks as much as what I've been quoting to you. It's different. The meanings are a little bit different. So, I can talk about this issue about tongues and languages, but I really think that Paul has given us the underlying principles to deal with any problems that we are facing inside of the church. And so when we talk about 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, let's look and see what principles we can bring out of it. Amen? Take 
take your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. We'll start with verses 2 and 3. 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, verses 2 and 3. And here, in the 14th chapter, he starts off with reminding us again to re pursue love. He feels that of all of the gifts, he encouraged them to seek after prophecy. And then he goes on and he says, For he who speaks in, in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. I want you to understand what we're talking about here. When we're talking about the spiritual gifts that we're given by God, I believe that the first principles are basically these two here. The first one is edification, which means to build up. Now, I have a diagram there. That's a diagram of how to build a fence in the backyard. Now, if I just say to most of you, go build a fence in the backyard, how good are you going to do? I know what some of you are going to do. You're, you're going to get you're going to get your cell phone and you're going to get here and you're going to Google people who can put up fences, right? <laughs> So, we need to learn that when we are given gifts, and everyone who has become a member of this church, God has given you a spiritual gift in order to help build up the church. Did you know that? You have something to build up the church. But what do we often do inside of the church? Are we builders up or we tear down? Now, tearing down is okay if what, what, what are we going to do afterwards? Build up. Are we edifying the church? Are we trying to build up the church to improve what is going on, to try and make things better here? Are we interested in helping one another out? Are we interested in making things clear? So if we can take the diagram and get across to people about what the gospel of Jesus Christ so that we can help them to become what? More like Jesus. Isn't that what we're here for? Amen. We're trying to help one another to become more like Jesus. And so we need to just say, now I can all say to you, give your heart to Jesus Christ, get down on your knees, ask for forgiveness for sin, drink. Those are all good things to do. But if I'm going to help build up the church, what do I need to do even inside of my life? I'm going to have to help you along the way to help build you up also. Amen. When's the last time you tried to help build someone else up in the church? You know what churchgoers are known for? This is universal, isn't it? When our mothers did this to us, what were we thinking? My mother was good at, she still is good at putting guilt. Any of you have mothers who are good at giving guilt? When they start pointing the finger like this, what do you start thinking? Put the finger away. Do any of us need to be convinced that we are sinners? Now, sometimes I do think that we forget. But do all of you here know that you are sinners? Do I need to from up front start picking on your sins? I can pick on those who are, uh, who are looking down on their phones right now and ask what games you're playing. Uh, those of you who are talking to one another, I can get on to your case. Uh, those of you who, uh, who may be spending more time with your primary treasures and your guide magazines rather than listening to, see, 
we can pick up all sorts of things that are going on. So folks, do you need more help in knowing that you're not perfect? Do you? Edification means we need to build up one another. And we need to do the next thing with it, which is exhortation. Now, I know exhortation. You believe that exhortation is only that first word that is there, which is what? Admonition. We're really good at doing that. Now, let me tell you, if you want to be a good person, you want to keep the Sabbath right, this is what you need to do. And we got plenty of people who are ready to tell you what you need to do in order to live your right life right. Isn't that true? But you see, what's the next word that is there? In fact, the, the word is repeated twice. The, the uh, word that is here is pericles, which is, means admonition, but it also means comfort. And he uses another para. Greek word to follow it up in order to mean comfort again. So he wants to get it across twice so that we will understand. Part of admonition is what? Comfort. Does the church feel like this is a comfortable place for you to be? If people don't feel comfortable here, what are they going to do? How many people were thinking when they got out of bed, boy, this is a nice, comfortable bed. I don't want to leave it this morning. Some of you are brave. The church should be a place of comfort. It should also be a place of encouragement. Sometimes I think that we find comfort and encouragement in other places such as the media. But I don't see that being in the computer all the time. By the way, that's part of the media. And young people, I know that here in the computer is probably a lot more than what pastor is. I, I know it's Let's see, Facebook is a biggie, and Twitter, YouTube, uh, what are some of the others? Instagram, mm -hmm. <laughs> but when we come to church, we need to build up one another, we need to exhort, which means to admonish, but and encourage all at the same time. You know what we find? The reason why we are here is not to just do our own thing. We are here to encourage one another so that we will continue living the life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 14 verses 7 and 8 Even things without life, whether flutes or harps, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sound, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? Folks, we are in the middle of a, of a battle, whether we like it or not. You can give up and, and think that if you give in to sin, do everything that the world wants you to do, that you know you're no longer part of the battle. Wrong. You will always be part of the battle, for good or for bad. Now, I got a picture up there. That's a picture. 
a trumpet or a bugle. You know the the, uh, the military in this country uh, still uses the bugles and and uh, trumpets in order to to do things. It used to be that if you were taking a whole unit into into war, the way that you can control that unit was to blow the trumpet in a certain way. And when it blew certain things, then you knew that you were supposed to go forward or to retreat. General Butterfield in the, in the Civil War was known for, for using the bugle and creating music, or it's not music, sounds in order to tell his troops to do. In fact, we all know one of the tunes that he did for, for the bugle. It's called Taps. We still use Taps today. You know, this is Memorial Weekend. Why do we celebrate Memorial Weekend? Do you realize that over uh, 70 years ago, soon after Memorial Day, comes the day that marks when American, British, Canadian, French troops landed on the shores of Normandy in order to take Europe back. On a remembrance for what happened in, in Holland when they were freed, to this day, they play a song that is all supported by the orchestra with all its sounds, and at the middle of that whole song is taps. Do you realize that in Holland, they have people who take care of the graves of every single American, every British, every Canadian soldier who died in order to free them from the captivity of Germany. What are we doing as Christians today? Are we sounding? the sound so people know what it means to be a Christian? Are we sounding the sound that is going out there so that our lives are giving the right type of tune so that when we are sounding out there, people know that we belong to Jesus Christ? Or are we going out there and our music is absolutely wrong and we're not sharing about Jesus? Are we as dedicated as the people of Holland in honoring the dead from our country who freed them? Or have we given up on Jesus Christ and thinking that it does not matter what we do? We all use this as the basis of the music that we are to present. And even when the orchestra leader, the conductor, gets up there, he has all of the different instruments that are out there. And each instrument has their page of music. And on his, everything comes together. And he brings it together. Folks, if we are not looking to Jesus Christ, we are not going to sound right. We think along the way that we can do all of our individual things, go our individual directions. But folks, we have a responsibility to sound like a son and daughter of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what we're called to do. We cannot just go out there and sound any sound. We cannot be anything. We must understand when we belong to Jesus Christ, we must be like Jesus. Verses 22 and 23. Therefore, so, uh, uh, tongues or languages are for a sign, not for those who believe, but for the unbelievers. For prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. And therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues or languages, and uh, there come in those who are not informed or unbelievers, Will they not say that you are out of your...
your minds. It's bad enough they call us crazy, isn't it? Folks, he's reminding us here what we have been called to from the beginning. We are not called to go out there. If we have a gift, if we have something that the Holy Spirit has given us, we all have gifts that the Holy Spirit has given us to do. We are not out there on our own. We are to remember that the reason why we are here is what? To build a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. Isn't that why we come here on Sabbath morning? You are not coming here in order to pay some type of penance along the way. You are not here just to deposit your check behind the way and think that that is paying your, your dues for whatever is going on. In fact, when it comes down to it, the folks are going to be talking about money because it all deals with selfishness. But that's next month. Pray for me this week. I'm going to be in the ACBC all afternoon long. But do come out and enjoy the speakers. By the way, Ivor Myers, who's coming here, is one of the speakers at a camp meeting. We were able to get him to come by here. If you're not going to camp meeting, we're bringing a camp meeting speaker here. So you will have someone to take care of. <coughs> but why are we here, folks? Have we forgotten why we are here? We are here to worship. What is worship all about? The most profitable meetings for spiritual advancement are those which are characterized with solemnity and deep searching of the heart. Have you been searching your hearts this morning, folks? Each seeking to know himself and earnestly and in deep humility <coughs> seeking to learn what? To learn what? Of Jesus. Folks, there is no way I can bring you to the point, this point in a few short minutes of talking up here. If you want to be a part of a deep worship of God, you've had to work on this all week long. It means getting into this right here. It means getting down upon your knees and commun communing with God. It means that you are sharing with others that you've come across what Jesus has done for you. I cannot shorten that out. You've had to do that all week long. If you want a deep worship experience, you need to prepare yourself before you come to church Sabbath morning. Young people, middle-aged people. I won't go any farther. <laughs> if you are not saying in your heart, Jesus, I love you, why are you here? When we get to heaven, is it going to make a difference if you have a million or a billion dollars in your checking account? Or maybe just five? It's not going to make a difference, is it? Well, well, when we get to heaven, 
Is it going to make a difference whether you live in a house on the north side, the east side, or the west side? Whether you had a gate that you had to go through or you don't have any gate at all? Is it going to make a difference? I want you to understand that when you get to heaven, the only thing that you're going to take with you is what? Your character. And if you haven't learned how to say, Jesus, I love you, and that's a part of your character, I want you to look at your heart. Are you ready to say, Jesus, I love you? Have you given up everything? You know what? There's an interesting thing. She talks before that, and she says, that two, no, it's after it. It's a paragraph or two after where she talks about that some people don't like the fact that in the church they have to give up their individuality. That they have to get along in the congregation. But you know what she says? We are going to find out that when we work with one another that we will find that we have the greater thing that we have learned to become on Jesus. What have you given up along the way? You see, that's what the world is telling you. The world is trying to tell you, oh, you've given up so much. Oh. <laughs> when I, when you see Jesus, That's why we come to worship, folks. One last thing. You know, I know I have not done this chapter justice. There's more to it. I tried to bring out some important things. But Paul finishes with this. How then, brother, whenever we come together, each of you has a, a song, has a teaching, has a tongue, as a revelation, as an interpretation, let all things be done for what? Edification or for building up. He's talking about order here. Now how many of you would like to see this sign on the restroom when you need to go? Badly. I hate to admit it, but there was a uh, there was a ladies' room or two that I've gone into because there was that type of sign outside of the men's room. Is that the kind type of sign that we have outside of our church? Out of order. I know most of you do not see it, but we have worship leaders in this church, people who try to do their, their greatest ability. I, uh, I want to thank Kizzy. I, I, I want to thank uh, Rick for leading out and trying to pull the worship together. We try to do things in order in this church. And then on Sabbath morning, they come up here, and, and they practiced last night, and everything was all set, ready to go. Everything was lined up with the soundboard. And then they got here Sabbath morning, and, and the guitars weren't talking with the sound system. But none of this is anything we are not in order in making sure that in this church we're talking about Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. All in proper order. I have a hard time. I have to learn sometimes to stop my mouth from moving and let's 
see when others are talking. Anyone else have a problem? I got at least one compound right here. And I know there's a whole bunch of you that feel the same type of thing, but you're not brave enough to raise your hands. We have to learn the proper type of order in order to help. You have been brought into this body of Jesus Christ. You have different jobs, different positions, a different education. Some of you come from countries that aren't on this side of the Atlantic or this side of the Pacific. Some of you even come from the Indian Ocean area. But still, when we come here, there is some type of order that goes on that we know that we are worshiping the same God and the same Lord. Amen? Amen. We are here and we are together. And we do not want this to be a place of out of order, but we want this to be a place of order, a place where we can come, where everyone feels like they are part of what is going on, a part of what is happening. No, we're not perfect. This will never be a perfect place until Jesus comes. Never. We have a few hypocrites in this church. Let's pray for them. I didn't get an amen out of that. Just, you know. But if this is a place of order, we need to remember why we are here. And Mr. Rick, the day that we have a perfect worship service, we're going to jump for joy, where nothing goes wrong and everything is right with the world. But until that day comes, it probably won't be until we get up to the courts of heaven. But all that we've done here will come to fruition because when we're by Jesus, what a wonderful thing it will be to realize that we've done everything in order to grow closer to the image of Jesus Christ. You know, pastors, teachers, we all got to do the same thing. You bring up the review towards the end. Fortunately, you're not getting a quiz. You graduates, you're going to miss quizzes. Nah. <laughs> this is a place of edification, of exhortation. We are doing it out of love where we want to encourage one another and help one another. We need to be understandable with our meaning and everything that we mean, everything that we stand for is found in this book right here. I know that there are some times that in this world that they believe that we are out of tune with what is going on. We should accept all sorts of things that are happening. No. This is the standard. We believe that Jesus Christ created us so we can be understandable with his meaning, which all is based out of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should have everlasting life. And I love what he says now. I did not come into this world to what? To condemn the world. We need to remember all the time we need to be on point. We have believers and we need to have non-believers that we are working with. And the goal is to bring everyone to what? To be like Jesus. Isn't that the order? Are we striving to become like Jesus here in this church? Are you striving to be like Jesus? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear 
Father in heaven, we are grateful for everything that you have done for us. I pray now that you will help us to be like Jesus. And may we learn that when things are out of line, it is not time to just to condemn one another, but to encourage one another to look at Jesus. That anywhere where Jesus is, we can safely go. We ask this all in Jesus Christ, precious and holy name. Amen. Now, unto the King eternal, 